The president of Central African Republic wins a second term, but the opposition says the election was neither free nor fair. So, can the president unite a country divided by a civil war and a humanitarian crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The Central African Republic's president has been re-elected in a vote marred by violence and intimidation. The Electoral Commission says Faustan Arkanj Touadera won 53% of the ballots last Sunday. He avoids a second round runoff with opposition candidates who say the vote was flawed. Many polling stations didn't open on election day. Rebels are reported to have attacked voters and staff. And groups allied with former President Francois Bozizé seized a town 20 kilometers from the capital, Bangui. Prosecutors are investigating whether Bozizé tried to disrupt the ballot. People don't need weapons to take power. We have suffered so much. The president has done his best to bring the country forward in five years. That's why Central Africans voted for him. I support another party. I'm with the MLPC opposition group. But if the president won, it's because he deserves it. He's a man who's fought for this. Nicholas Hawk has been following the latest developments from Dakar. In a press conference, arch-rival to Touadera, Georges Anissé de Loguere says that the president has not won the popular vote, adding to the eight other candidates who have launched a complaint to the election commission, saying that there was not enough people that came out to vote. Only half of the electorate came out to vote, 900,000 people, and half of the polling stations were open, only 2,000 of them. That's because most of the country is now in the control or in the hands of armed groups. They're just 20 kilometers away from the capital, Bangui. They call themselves the Coalition for Patriotic Change. They say that President Tuatara is not respecting the peace agreement. They want more of a say in the country's future and more money. Meanwhile, in the capital of Bangui, there are Russian fighters who are trying to secure uh, the capital. Adding to that, there are the Rwandan troops sent by President Kagame to support the UN peacekeeping uh, force of 12,000 people. Despite all of these troops on the ground, while well, the armed groups are, are continuing to make uh, their advances towards the capital. Caught in all of this, of course, are the people of the Central African Republic who live in a country the size of France, rich in oil, diamond and minerals, and yet most of them live in dire poverty. Most of them live on less than $2 a day. And this country has become the battleground between Russia and the West, notably France, the former colonial power. Now, this election is supposed to resolve all of this, but so far it has failed to do so. We'll discuss all this with our panel in a moment, but first, let's take a closer look at the country's background. The Central African Republic has been struggling with violence since 2013, when a predominantly Muslim rebel group, the Seleka, seized power and ousted the president, Francois Bozizé. Since then, subsequent waves of violence have worsened, leading to the deployment of about 12,000 UN peacekeepers to support African Union and French troops a year later. In 2019, a peace deal was signed between the government and 14 armed groups. But the violence didn't end, and instead intensified. The conflict has killed thousands of people and displaced millions. All right, let's bring in our guests in Brussels, Peter Knoppe. He's a fellow at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, a South Africa-based think tank and a former Dutch diplomat. In London, Michael Lamoa is a senior visiting fellow at the Firoz Lalji Center for Africa at the London School of Economics. Welcome to the program. Michael, let me start with you today. You know, it had been reported that definitive results from this election um, were not expected before January 18th, but, you know, we've already heard from the Electoral Commission. They announced that uh, President Tuadera got 53% of the vote in the first round. Is this a surprise? And if so, what changed? Well, first of all, it's not a, it's not a surprise. I mean, there's not many votes to count. There was only about 910,000 registered voters. So that's not much to count. And also, perhaps there wasn't um, too much fuss about um, any potential or, 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 or alleged you know, um, electoral malpractice. So we would imagine that it was a pretty straightforward thing to do. 
Uh, Peter, did... It's not a surprise at all. All right. Thanks, Michael. Peter, did unrest keep voters from going to the polls? Yes, in, 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 in quite a number of places. Uh, there was, there was, it wasn't secure, it wasn't safe. Um, there was unrest. So there, there has been um, um, at least 14 out of, I think it was 80 um, different regions. Uh, there was no uh, possibility for people to go and vote. So yes, yes was yes. Michael, the opposition had tried to delay this election. Will they accept the result? I mean, what happens next? Well, I think um, the opposition initially um, complained that maybe perhaps there was some electoral fraud. Um, however, that hasn't been investigated. It's not going to be investigated. And it's not so much of a big deal um, for this particular election. I mean, if you actually compare what happened in Central African Republic to Mali, for example, where some 700 polling stations could not operate and some 4,000 odd other places there was disruption amidst bomb scares and mortar shells in Kedal region from Al Qaeda. If you compare that to what happened in Central African Republic, you could actually say that Central African Republic did much better. Um, I think what happens next, really, is that now that the election is over and the state is firmly in place, the governance issue has been settled, um, and you have a, legi a, a legitimate and a recognized government in place, I think the main thing to happen next, really, is to have a plan to go after the rebel movements, particularly Bozize and all the other rebel factions. Because... Um, Central African Republic really has quite a large swath of, you know, uh, territory not under government control, thick forest areas, harboring rebel groups. And if we don't deal with these rebel groups, they're going to be causing havoc from time to time. So it's quite, it's actually a good thing that a lot of international actors are at play, Rwanda, Burundi, perhaps the AU, French, um, Russian, all kind of... Um, contributing troops. And I think the next big thing really is that all these troop, you know, uh, reinforcements, all these troops amassing should really concentrate on a long-term plan to actually deal with rebel movements, mm. rebel rebel factions, was easy, and work out a long-term plan about what to do about, you know, the thick, uninhabited, unregulated forest areas. Peter, um, if I could ask you to expand a little bit on the point that Michael was making. I mean, first, can we can we talk a little bit about these armed groups? I mean, you know, who who are the groups that comprise these fourteen groups? Well, there's a there's a whole range, but they there, there's two major camps, if you want. There is the anti Balaka and the Exelica, um, and and the Exelica, roughly speaking, are the Muslim groups from north, north, east, and northwest. <clears throat> and the anti-Balaka are the groups, the Christian animist groups, uh, rather more south and central, um, that came into existence as a response mechanism to the, to the Seleka that, that marched into Bangui uh, some six years, seven years ago. Um, so those are the, but, but there's within those two different those two pillars there's there's a variety of different groups that compete between each other that um, compete over territory that that have their uh, you know their their um, confrontations between each other uh, but also have their sort of confined uh, territory where they rule and and are the major player uh, now it's the it is the accomplishment of Tuadera uh, I think he needs to be recognized for that, to ha that he has brought all these 14 players to the table and has signed a peace agreement that initially the international community and many, many others were doubting that it would hold. Uh, but it did for a long time uh, until, you know, April, April this year. Uh, and the elections played a very important part in, in disrupting uh, the very, the very uh, uh, peace deal. Michael, I saw you nodding to some of what Peter was saying there. Did you want to jump in? Yes, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, um, we could add that, um, well, if, if, if the current peace deal is going to be expiring this year, 
as Peter has said, then obviously we're looking at another um, renegotiation. Re it's quite important to note, though, that uh, whatever peace deal that has been signed in the past, were 2012, 2019, in Central African Republic, never ever satisfies all, all parties. Partly because the rebel factions are not under control. So in the long term, really, if you're looking to another peace deal that would hold in the long term, you actually want to have a scenario where you actually have the rebel groups under control and you're able to deal with them. And for once, you know, someone has to be able to tell these rebel groups that, you know, um, causing havoc and disrupting governance in Central African Republic is not the kind of game that can be played any longer. Um, and I think that message needs to go across quite strongly. So between now and the next deal, perhaps really what um, interested parties want to really think about is how best they can plan effectively that they really want to do with the rebel groups. And actually that you know, there's, there's no longer a game to play about interrupting with the governance in the Central African Republic. Peter, a few, moments, a few moments ago you were talking about, you know, the fact that President Tuadera, uh, you believed, deserved some recognition for some of his efforts. I want to ask you this. Do you believe he's going to be able to unite a, a very divided Central African Republic? Um, I'm extremely concerned. Extremely concerned. But try to imagine what happened. Um, in early 2019, in February 2019, these, these 14 groups signed a peace agreement. Uh, part of the peace agreement was that they took up positions, government positions, in Bangui. Uh, now, the next thing you know, there's elections. These people knew from the very start that they wouldn't make it, they wouldn't stand a chance in the elections. So, to to keep their positions, to 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 keep the positions that they were offered in the peace deal, they needed they they needed to do something. That none of them. Uh, participated in the elections as a, as a candidate, so they needed to do something and and to and to to make sure that they would keep some of the power, some of the influence, some of the positions that they had. They took up the arms, um, and I'm not sure if Tuadera will have the uh, position um, and the mandate to bring these people back to the negotiation table and offer them a position again. Um, this is this is going to be the challenge. Are these people going to be um, um, guaranteed and be uh, convinced that they will be able to take up positions within a new new forming a new government that's going to be formed? Michael, what do you think? Will President Tuadera be able to unite the country going forward? I think that the broader mandate for bringing the parties together, you know, where I came under the auspices of the UN. Uh, with some assistance from the African Union. And I think that template will be useful going forward. I mean, the current president will remain as the president. However, I think the, um, you know, um, the, the mandate to bring the parties together will, will fall out of the UN. And, and I think that perhaps, you know, at the table is when we really talk seriously about whether it's actually feasible um, and how much political room is given to the rebel factions. At the very least, you know, uh, if there's going to be any room for them to sit around the governance table, uh, we also need to think about disarmament as a precondition for that. Michael, let me interrupt so, you and just ask you a quick follow-up. How much of the country is actually under the control of these armed groups? Well, let's just say that perhaps about at least 70 percent of the country is not under government control. Let, let, let's put it that way. Uh, precisely how much is under um, rebel control um, that is relevant to Central Afri African Republic is debatable because some of these areas are also occupied by rebel factions that are operating elsewhere. We have the Lord's Resistance Army under Joseph Kony that is really targeting Uganda. We have rebel factions in the same territory also targeting South Sudan. We have rebel factions also playing games with DRC. So basically, Cameroon, DRC, South Sudan, the key countries around Central African Republic have rebel groups that are all stationed in Central African Republic. So, I mean, to come back to your question, 
at least 70 percent of the country mm. is not under government control but then not all the rebel factions are operating against central african republic it become a kind of a safe haven and actually not just for central african republic but for the sake of all the other countries around and particularly for the au something really needs to be done about the mm. unregulated forest regions in central african republic Peter, the Constitutional Court rejected former President Bouzizé's presidential candidacy. Uh, they said that he did not satisfy the good morality requirement because of an arrest warrant and UN sanctions against him for allegedly ordering assassinations, torture, and Correct. other crimes when he was president. What is going to happen with these investigations against the former president? I mean, are prosecutions going to be carried out? Well, that's the idea, yes. Um... Will, that, will they be able to do it? It's difficult to say. Uh, but the idea is to bring him to justice. Um, um, and, and I think the Constitutional Court couldn't do otherwise than, you know, what they did. The, the course they took was the, was the only uh, course they, they could take. Um, what Bouziza did to the country in 2013 is obviously just has, was the starting point of, of many of the, of the conflicts that they're still um, in. Um, now, on the point of the of the, the territory that is under control of the government, the interesting thing is that when the 2019 peace agreement was signed, the the, the all of a sudden, suddenly, the 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 uh, a, a bigger, a much bigger chunk of the gov of the territory was under the control of the government because the government changed in its composition. Uh, the the rebel, the 14 rebel groups joined the government and then by definition obviously the control of the government of the territory was much bigger now what the what the elections elections did is disturb that process that's what happened so today suddenly the government has no control over the over the territory because the rebel groups are no longer a part of the government so the the, the big issue now will be um will the the rebel groups rejoin the government after the elections, yes or no, um, and and that is that is a a very delicate um, situation and process that we'll be seeing over the, the the next couple of months. Michael, how much of a disruptor can the former president be? I mean, how how powerful does he remain? Well, not too powerful, but then that's only because he has now joined up with the rebels. In 2012, for example, these same um, Patriots for Patriots Coalition for Change, the current rebel you know, um, coalition, in 2012 were actually on the opposite side against Bozize. They had another name then called Coalition Patriots for CJ for Justice, some other name. And Bozizé was against them, uh, 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 and they were not able to agree on something else, and then the coup took place. So now Bozizé has joined um, the rebel factions, if you like, and that has kind of empowered him to a certain extent. The extent of his power will depend on whether the rebel factions want to incorporate him as part of the chess game going forward. Uh, but particularly now that he has some specific, you know, allegations leveled against him, um, he's going to kind of be isolated in the proceedings. If there's going to be any seats around the table to renegotiate another peace deal, Buzize will not be a valid candidate um, to sit around the table. Um, and I think the rebel factions will be aware of that. One of the um, difficulties really is that at any peace deal, whether in 2019 or in the future, one of the things that the rebels are actually asking for is not just a hand in governance, but also that their troops will be merged or added into the national army. Um, <laughs> that is, is, is a very difficult thing to actually achieve because to have these in the national army, basically you're asking for another coup next. Mm. Um, it's something which is quite difficult to, to, to work out exactly how to be able to achieve that. But we'll have to watch the space for that. Uh, Peter, I, I want to take a look at the humanitarian crisis that's enveloping the country as well. I mean, the UN says that over half the population in Central African Republic is in need 
of some form of humanitarian assistance. I mean, how worried are you that the, the dire, the already dire humanitarian circumstances there are only going to worsen because of the, the instability? Yeah, no, well, that, that, the, the chances of that happening is, is extremely high. Um, the political process will, will be delicate, but the humanitarian um, uh, situation will even be more delicate. Um, because the rebels, don't forget, the rebels do not necessarily represent the people. Uh, they represent their own interests, not much more than, than the interests of the people. So the people have suffered um, in the hands of the, of the rebels. Um, and, and they will continue to, to suffer as long as the political process is not go going to come to an outcome, uh, a, a proper and, and positive outcome. The, during all through 2019 and the first bit of 2020, the violence um, uh, came down. The, no the number of incidents came down. The peace, the peace dividend um, as a result of the, of the uh, peace agreement was there. The people were relieved. There was some form of going back to normal. And as uh, our colleague just said, uh, DDR and reconciliation was supposed to be part of the, of the, of the peace agreement. The, the DDR, the dis demobilization, the disarmament and reintegration of some of the rebels is a process that has started. Uh, but there's also the, the feeling amongst the people that that is giving a um, a price, a, a, a bonus for being a rebel. Um, so the, the population also wanted to profit from, from the peace and the reconciliation part hasn't started, partly because of the COVID and the, and the corona, partly because, you know, some of the, these, these processes are, are slow processes. So to, my honest... Um, uh, opinion is is that the the elections were too early in the, in 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 terms of timing, uh, and and the, the public the the general population is going to suffer from it. Michael, if the situation continues to worsen, if the violence continues, I want to ask you a similar question. I mean, how much worse does it get for civilians? Because you know, violence against civilians and humanitarian workers in Central African Republic is still quite high, isn't it? Yes, it is still quite high, and that kind of adds more to the insecurity um, of the civilians. Um, it doesn't bring confidence in the government. It doesn't, you know, um, you know, help civilians to actually live in peace. Um, one of the things which probably needs to be considered is actually perhaps maybe revising you know, or amending the mandate of the UN force there, because usually the general peacekeeping mandate is basically just to keep the peace. But I think if we look at the role that the UN troops played a few days before the elections, was more like peace enforcement, really, when they realized that the rebels were actually advancing towards the capital and positioned themselves at vantage points just to make sure that they keep the rebels at bay and to allow the elections to happen. That's more like peace enforcement. And that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of proactive activity that you expect that the troops should also be playing. So I think perhaps maybe a revision of the mandate is necessary if, you know, the country is, able, is going to be able to actually deal with rebel factions and other security problems. All right, um, we just have about a minute left, um, Peter. Let me just ask you very quickly. I know it's a big question, but again, we only have about a minute left. What are the regional implications of continued violence and insecurity in Central African Republic? Hey, that's a huge question. Um, don't forget, just uh, you know, as, as my colleague just said, um, the, some of the regional powers are playing their own game in Central African Republic. Uh, so there's there's a lot at play. You know, if if this new insecurity, new um, uh, violence, is giving an opportunity some, to some of the neighboring states to um, regain their position and, mm -hmm. and retake um, um, their position, it will it will be mm -hmm. tremendously um, uh, uh, how do you say that bad for for not just Central African Republic but for the whole region. All right, we've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to our guests, Peter Canope and Michael Amoa.
And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We're at at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.